Uh, I'm going to introduce Dale, who will be our first speaker today. Dale's the director of the Alzheimer's Association Santa Cruz office. She joined the association in 1998 and has more than 25 years of experience working as a recreation therapist and program director in clinical and community-based settings. She's a nationally certified recreation therapist. Her professional experience has given her the pleasure of working with older adults with special needs, persons with developmental and physical challenges, and families living with cognitive impairments such as Alzheimer's disease. Dale grew up in Louisville, Kentucky, and received her BA in therapeutic recreation from the University of Kentucky in Lexington in 1983. And then she quickly came to her senses and moved to California in 1988. <laughs> She's currently in between Gilroy and Santa Cruz. And on her leisure time, she enjoys hiking, gardening, traveling, cooking, and being creative. So Dale is going to take it over and introduce the topic. Thank you. I saw my on button here. Hang on a sec. I'm not used to these. If I can see it. There we go. Hello. Can you hear me now? Yes. Is that good? Okay. Yes, it's my five minutes of getting to pretend I'm like Madonna today. <laughs> Don't ask me to bust out my dance moves for you, though. That won't be part of the activity presentation. So, um, thank you all so much and welcome. And on behalf of Carol, who I'll introduce in a little bit as well, and myself, um, we hope today to, in a very short period of time, give you kind of an overview of things to um, expose you to new and old ideas to increase your sense of self-confidence with trying new things or to kind of affirm a lot of the things that um, you're continuing to try to develop, to affirm what you're already doing, and to foster some creative thinking. So I hope that we hit those targets for you today. Um, how many of you were able to hear a little bit of the music that was playing when you first entered the room? Okay, all right. Because that's um, part of our first exercise, if you will. For those of you who heard it, and we were playing, what were we, what did you hear playing? In the mood. I am in the mood for love. Okay. How many of you may have felt an emotional response by hearing that music? Okay. And would you like to share that, anybody, what you felt? I felt like dancing. You felt like dancing. Great. Okay. Felt like dancing, even more than just an, uh, an emotional piece to it. The music actually evoked um, the initiation of a physical kind of activity and desire. And music can do that. It can be a conduit um, for many different kinds of things. Um, how many of you, for that piece of music, evoked a memory for you? Did it take you back to a certain place? A woman back there raised her hand. Would you want to tell me what that, share that, what that memory was? Are you comfortable with that? Only part of it. <laughs> Only part of it? Okay. When I was in college, my roommate made up new words to that song. <laughs> so her roommate in college, her roommate made up new words to that song, and she said, "I'll stop right there because maybe it gets R-rated or something." <laughs> Anybody else have a um, a memory that it evoked? Yes, ma'am. Well, it, it reminded me of uh, watching uh, Sankey and our game when I was a kid. Okay. And uh, one of the characters in it would sing it to Darla. Okay. And that, that was a happy yeah. memory for me. Right, right. So it shows you how music can um, really elicit a lot of emotions and memories and a connection to the past and also just the physicality of something, wanting to get up. And a lot of times with uh, Alzheimer's and memory impairment, people, uh, sort of part of the disease, if you will, is uh, losing the ability to initiate things. So they need someone to model it for them or to partner with them. Or they need other tools like we'll learn about today, like music and people around them in art and other kinds of mediums to sort of help um, provoke that connection, if you will, to get the particular um, activity experience started. So, um, and then just last one to the music. How many, were there any of you that it just didn't really resonate with that particular song? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just, just nothing there. That's good, because that's a good example of how choosing the right kind of music is very important. While we can say that music is like a universal language, it does cross many different languages and cultures and ages and things like that, it's not necessarily one size fits all. So you can't expect to just have some canned music without knowing the whole person, what their life was, what era they grew up in, 
what types of music they were interested in and being able to individualize it. It's not just one size fits all, so it's really important to know the individual and the groups of individuals that you're working with in that regard. Someone asked too, when we speak of groups and individuals, how many of you, just so we kind of know, and to help Carol and I too, are um, from uh, here as a one-on-one, uh, -on -one, a family member, caregiver, and looking for ideas in your home? To do in your home, okay, great. And then how many of you are from like a community setting, a day program, or 24-hour um, care setting, something like that? Okay, all right, great. So looking, sometimes for individual activities there, and then other times for, for group setting uh, types of activities as well. So important to know too that we're kind of doing literally, and we'll, uh, uh, Carol will walk you through some an art piece uh, this, uh, later on, but we're literally doing large brush, brush strokes, so to speak, of what we're trying to accomplish uh, with your family members, with individuals, and then also with groups of individuals with very diverse backgrounds and you know cultural interests and things like that as well. So keep that in mind. And as our disclaimer, Carol, that I talked about this last night, but you know if we aren't really getting specific enough for where you'd like to take this today in the hour that we have, um, to please feel free to call on us as a reference because even though I've been doing this for about 25 years, I'm always learning new things from people with memory loss. And um, often, sometimes the way I would plan a particular activity or program did not necessarily go A, B, C format. And so I learned to kind of embrace the spontaneity of it and the unpredictability of it, of how people might own something or misinterpret an item or an object or something. And so I want to invite you to not be intimidated by those kinds of things and say, oh my gosh, I really, I blew that. That didn't go the way that I planned, but just to use it as a learning experience and to say, hmm, I would have never thought to use that object that way, but they did, so how can I modify this? So to keep those kinds of things in mind too, and, um, and to call us if you run into some of those barriers and you want to individualize something or you're trying to um, promote some things for a larger group uh, in, a, in a care setting. I've worked in those kinds of settings, so I know those sorts of challenges, and feel free to call on us as a reserve there. So, um, but back to music, you know, I've seen music uh, take someone from a very, very upset and angry place, um, cursing, very upset, I think she felt very frightened, we think that she may have had some kind of abuse in her childhood even that was triggered sometimes during a bathing routine, and I've seen uh, my friend Ruth, as I'll call her, go from that really upset and frightened place to a very um, calm and engaged and secure place just by using the right kind of music in, I'm not kidding you, in about three or four minutes. So it's really powerful to witness those sorts of things. I've also seen a good friend of mine many years ago, I'll refer to as Earl, who had a large man, had a lot of trouble getting from the bed, standing up, um, had a, a, a shuffling type shuffling gait, uh, very limited mobility um, because of the advances of Alzheimer's disease. But when we put on uh, Patsy Klein, when we did dancing in the morning, that was our form of exercise, um, and crazy um, for you, he just could dance as smooth as glass. So there was something neuronally there that was quite magical and powerful to see how that just sort of freed that up for him. And again, the right kind of music to be able to do that. So whether you're pursuing something like that individually with your partner, and it's a way to still remain bonded and very intimate as a form of dance or, or a connection through music, or are you doing this with a, a, you know, a large group setting in a care home? And you just never know kind of the power of how those sorts of things will be embraced and how it can really open up different doors where there might have been limitations for someone. Um, and as I mentioned with Ruth being really upset and angry, you know, that's the best kind of psychotropic that there is, right? If you could just imagine that you could put on a piece of music and take someone from a really angry or scared or frightened place just by a piece of music as opposed to a pill with all these other side effects, you know, what a great world it would be. So I want you just to keep in mind, and that's why we have the music playing intentionally today to kind of give you a little bit of an idea um, around the power of that. And you'll, you'll see me reference in general ways to a little bit more about music. I started with this slide on routine because it's so important for our family members. Sometimes things that you or I might perceive as sort of boredom um, and repetitious are really quite grounding for people with memory loss. They need routine because it builds on familiarity. And when you build on familiarity, you decrease anxiety and you increase uh, feelings of security and empowerment and a sense of control. 
So even if you're having coffee or tea every day at the same time in the morning and you're doing exercise or you're reading the paper to a family member or a group, you're doing these same kinds of things. And sometimes they might feel a little bit boring to you, but I'm telling you that they, they really will create uh, those grounded feelings for whether you're in a care setting or at home. Um, just that sense of, of control and security. You can mix it up a little bit, but it helps. And it's not the kind of routine I'm talking about where exactly at 10.30 every day in the morning we do this, right? But just, you know, within the general idea. How many of you have kind of already stumbled upon that? Do you feel like you, you do that? And it has can you tell a difference, not only for your family member, but probably for yourself, right? It gives you that sense of predictability. And you know there are going to be those mornings where someone doesn't want to get up or that kind of thing, right? Where you need to kind of do what I call kick and punt, right? Or be a little bit more flexible or take the list of to-dos from, you know, down from five to one or two and to kind of modify those things. But sense of routine. And I think often we maybe um, take that piece for granted. So I just wanted to sort of begin the day um, by starting out with, with that kind of value. And it can be all kinds of things. A lot of families in our early stage support groups um, you know, swear by just getting up in the morning, taking their time to kind of greet the day, if you will, however that may be, by reading or with um, a little bit of coffee or tea or something. And then physical exercise, you know, we really cannot underestimate the value of that. Getting out and whether it's walking or hiking or going to the park or whatever level of ambition that you might do, just the physical activity and getting out of the house and connecting to your community is huge. And a lot of folks, especially in the early stages, say that, you know, that really helps them reduce their stress and just feel like they can kind of cope with the day a lot better, you know. So um, I want you to consider experimenting, too, with things that, um, and how many of you do see when you see these kinds of things like music or reading, walking, the dog, brushing the cat, those kinds of things. How many of you all are sort of, does that look familiar to some of the things that you're doing? Okay. All right. And volunteering. Have any of you tried volunteering with your partner? You can, you know, you can do this in a group home setting too. Maybe you're making uh, bird houses. Maybe you're sanding down wood and you're painting them and you're assembling them. And the bird houses are going to go to Habitat for Humanity or um, a children's home or something like that. So that, you know, you can volunteer in a lot of different ways. But just being able to volunteer with your partner still gives you that sense of connection creates routine, familiarity, sense of contribution to your community, and those things are really important. Anyone out there that is volunteering maybe with their family member in the early stages now? Anyone that they want to share? Mm -hmm. uh, my husband is volunteering at the daycare center where he goes to. Okay. But I would like to know if there is any organization which you could take a high-level Alzheimer patient with you, like the food bank or something like that. Is there any organization like that that would accept you? Yeah, I think so. Um, so the question is, um, would, is there any kind of organization out there in the community where, uh, Stephanie's raising her hand, where they would accept you? I'm guessing Second Harvest is the first thing that comes to my mind. Um, so long as a person, even in the early stages with memory loss, has a memory partner with them there to help with all the sequencing and remembering the steps. and so that it's successful, because you want to make sure you build in the right kind of support to that kind of thing. The idea is to foster a sense of control and security, right? And to be there to guide them, not to do it for them, but with them, and to minimize any kind of anxiety and frustration. Did you want to say something, Stephanie? Yes, I know that the San Francisco SPCA has had some of oh, our yeah. early stage folks holding towels for them, and they can do things at the animal shelters. Right, so the SPCA and being able to fold towels for the animal shelter and things like that, um, you know, writing um, from, I'm thinking from a care home too, like just sitting down and signing greeting cards and sending them off to our veterans at the holiday. Um, one of the family members in our early stage group does go with a memory partner, and he actually volunteers at the animal shelter with walking animals. Now, he would need someone with him to help be successful with that kind of routine and responsibility. But there are lots of opportunities for that. And I love it when you can take a need and fill a gap, you know? And those are the kinds of things you're talking about doing when you're volunteering. It just gives you a, a better sense as a partner to being together and connected uh, with, with your family member when you're doing that. I think you feel like you're still, you know, you're still pursuing life and you're making a difference to others. 
Um, experiment and keep what works, you know. Try new things out. You may, maybe Alzheimer's disease has entered your life and you're not able to travel in the ways that you thought that you might be able to do with these late life years, okay? But maybe your library is having a used book sale and you go and, and your mission is to look for a large um, photograph, uh, picture type book, like a coffee table type book of different countries. And you bring it home and part of your morning ritual now while you're having tea or coffee is to look through the picture book and to talk about these beautiful places and to talk about the people that are there and the kinds of foods that you might eat and that type of thing. So there are lots of ways I think you can look at adapting things and still being able to experiment a little bit and embrace what's important and not feel like you're giving up on all of those dreams that you pursued. You still can't pursue it in the same way perhaps, um, but there are all kinds of ways when you use your imagination and you become really creative um, that you can still pursue things that are meaningful to you. Okay, and just lastly there on that slide is activities. You know, you really, whenever they can, sometimes you need someone else to come in and help with activities. You need an adult day program, or you want to consider hiring someone. I'm already down to five minutes. Okay, um, I'm going to need to move quickly. Uh, and um, so you want, might want to consider hiring someone, but when you can, consider activities that are going to benefit both of you. You know, and that, if that's what I mean by volunteering, getting out, walking, hiking, doing those things together, and really enjoying that together because there's so much personal loss and so many changes in the intimacy of your relationship that it's really important to look for things you can do together as well as looking for other people outside of that that can support you with those kinds of things. And whenever I refer to the word activities, you know, it always sounds like such a simple word, but I really just think, translate that in over to, you know, quality of life. These activities, because they sound like such a simple thing, and yet they're very, 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 very powerful and very, very important. And really, what you're doing is enhancing the quality of life. Always trying to pursue that that type of goal. Okay. I wanted to just break this down a little bit for you and just remind you of all the different kinds of domains, if you will, of who we are as a human being. You know, we have physical needs, social needs, spiritual and emotional needs, and also within that falls things like. Um, religion and culture, okay, and cognitive needs. So I wrote down a lot of different ideas, and I know that you all have this uh, handout in front of you to be able to take home. So uh, time won't really allow me to um, elaborate much on these. I'll, I'll kind of put out a couple of um, finer points there with getting out of the house, and I say that more than once, but a lot of times I think when, as a care partner, we are hanging on to our independence of staying in the home so much that sometimes we don't realize that we aren't always getting out of the house. And when someone walks up to the door and they want to leave and we tell them, oh, no, no, don't go out yet, right? They're not really wandering. They're seeking. They're seeking a connection outside of the house. They're seeking exposure to sunlight and to the people around them and a connection to their community. And you can apply the same kind of thing as well when you're working in 24-hour care setting. When folks walk to your door, they're on a mission. They need to go to work, they need to pick up their, their kids from school. They need that connection to the community and that sense that they are getting out and moving about and doing things that are important not only to them, but to others, okay? Um, so I just want to reinforce that a lot because a lot of times I think we label folks with these kind of negative terms like wandering when really they're seeking and they're, what they're seeking is a basic human right to be around other people, to have a sense of contribution, and um, to feel good about yourself and to feel the fresh air and watch the leaves blow on the trees, you know? And are you building those kinds of things into your daily routine, whether you're at home or you're in a care setting? And if you aren't, you really should be looking at that kind of thing as well. Um, the only thing that might not be so intuitive if you take these things home and read them later is the quote unquote under uh, spiritual emotional needs of pets for plants. And really it should be plants for pets. But there's a, a, a gentleman called Rich, uh, named Richard Taylor, and he uh, wrote a book I refer to a lot called A View From Within. And he's living in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease. And he has a little piece in there where he talks about instead of caring for a pet, where he'd have to pick up after him and clean up after him and all of that, um, he'd rather just care for plants because it gives him a sense of caring for something else and nurturing something else but without all the responsibility of something like a pet. Now, I have a border collie and two cats at home, and I love pets, and I think that they, um, pets and animals in general and children and caring for those types of things are, are very powerful and very necessary, and we should build them in any time we can. But I thought that his was a really sweet and humorous way of looking at, you know, kind of, well, I don't think I want to adopt a dog, but I still do want to, want to care for things. And even if this plant dies because I neglected a little bit, that's, 
a lot less traumatic than if something happened to you know my cat and my dog. So um, keep those things in mind as well. Uh, and then the last thing I just put in there a little bit about cognitive needs, and this is just sort of looking at the mental things that all of us need to do as adults, that our functional abilities may be declining a bit, um, but we still are adults with adult accomplishments and uh, adult drives, and we want to be able to do things that are very adult-like. So I find things like colored dominoes and going to like the teacher learning education supply stores, you can find things that are really age appropriate for adults but sort of adapted um, for a person's maybe more impaired cognitive needs. And even with the color, the building blocks and things one time, someone built a, a garden path when we did that. Another person did think it was a little bit childish, but I told him that we were experimenting a bit for an elementary school to see how kids might respond to this. And so I still was able to kind of parlay it into um, a little bit of an, an adult piece so he didn't feel offended by it. And another uh, gentleman built uh, sort of a sculpture and another person built, um, as he labeled it, the, uh, the bridge over the river Kwai. So um, you never know where people will take these kinds of things. So I say give it a try. Not everyone may interpret it the same way or pleasurably, but throw these things out there. Um, someone may not be able to cook anymore, uh, but maybe they could still look through cookbooks, they could discuss a recipe, they could put on an apron, you could create a shopping list for them. Okay, So you can still create a lot of these virtual experiences. Excuse me, I keep thinking I have to walk over here. So I'm down to like zero minutes. Yes. Okay, zero minutes and, uh-oh, three more slides. So I'm just going to kind of be able to summarize here, you guys. I don't want to take away from Carol's time as well. Um, but meaningful engagement means to, anytime you're creating an activity, you want to create a sense of calm and connection and joy and pride. And if you see an activity increasing anxiety or a kind of nonverbal response like, oh, what is this? You know, use that as your guide. You know that, whoa, well, wait a minute, that one didn't go quite the way I thought it was going to be. Eight out of ten people really enjoyed that in a group setting, but two didn't, so I need to consider their needs next time and differently, right? That's a little bit different than when you're trying to do something one-on-one -on -one in your home. Um, consider things active versus passive. It's really important mid-morning and early afternoon, that's when our folks are usually more successful and feel like they sort of everything is kind of all the, the pistons are firing properly and they can do a little bit more complex type thing um, and getting out of the house a little bit more. But you know, we don't need to listen to a 10-piece band all day long, so we all need to respect the kind of downtime as well um, that we need. And that could just be coming back home and taking a short nap having a little cup of decaf tea and putting on some soft music in the background. But be sure that you balance that with the physical activity, getting out of the house, that kind of thing, more active um, activity, and in addition to saving time in the afternoon uh, with passive. One woman had uh, shared with me recently a family member that um, they'd gone to the doctor in the morning and then um, they had gone and picked up prescri a prescription at the uh, drugstore and then she said, and now we're going to go to Costco. And she said, her husband just blew up at her. And I said, well, you know, it's probably too much active, right? And while you're out, not out running around and walking around the track or something in that kind of active way, there's too many things for him going on. It's too much stimulation. And so, you know, rightly so, she went ahead and took him home and said, uh, Costco for another day, you know? Even on my good days, I'm not crazy enough running into Costco, so. Um, but that's a good example of sort of how to balance things. And sometimes we have these long lists that we wanted to accomplish because we're already out there and we want to do it. But, you know, we, we have to learn to kick and punt and revise things. Same thing can be true in a group setting. You know, maybe everyone is just a little bit off that day and things just aren't going to happen the way that we had hoped that they do. So we're always balancing kind of active versus passive. And we didn't have the time today to address stage related activities, but I'm happy to help you break that down in a really individualized and personalized way. Just want to remind you about working with the whole person. Um, I love this quote, it's important to know what person the disease has as opposed to what disease the person has. A gentleman, Sir William Osler, said that back in 1849, you know, but do you get it? Don't define the person by the disease. That's a small part of who they are, and it may be creating big barriers for you, but don't forget who that whole person is that you're working with. It's why I went into recreation therapy, because I wanted to be able to celebrate and honor the whole person, and not just look at one particular impairment or one disease, but I wanted to be able to see the whole person and help them redefine their self and rediscover those things and find conduits and connections from the past 
that helped them still feel a sense of accomplishment and to be able to honor all that they had done um, throughout their life. So know a person's favorite foods. Those can be great motivators. Uh, my boyfriend, I always say, if he doesn't want to come do something later on when he gets older, we're going to say, well, you're going to have really good margaritas at the end of this, so then that's a motivator for him. He's going to want to come and, go back and do that particular kind of activity. So know those kinds of things that are important, and know if any of your family members have ever experienced something really traumatic um, or upsetting, because, of course, we don't want to do anything that might be inviting that, and if we stumble into that, we want to be mindful of that part of their past and how to be able to reassure them. Last slide, I apologize to Carol, taking, taking more time than I should, um, is to think about you know, sort of all of the creative arts and creative expression. Because here there really is no right or wrong okay, with this kind of thing. It doesn't matter if someone chooses black or red, or they paint a beautiful picture and then they paint over it. It's the process. There is no right or wrong. Um, with a lot of traditional crafts, one step is built on the next one, and if you don't do the first step right, the second step's not going to look good, right? And it's really all about your process anyways, but what happens with the frontal lobe when there's damage in the brain is that um, it, it disinhibits people, and it causes them sometimes to do things that are a little bit embarrassing maybe, right? Or unpredictable and spontaneous. But the creative arts can really seize upon that. So when someone maybe was a lot more reserved before they had memory loss and Alzheimer's disease, now they're a lot more playful. They're less serious. They're more spontaneous. And a lot of things like the arts and collage work and painting and a little bit of theater and improv with the right kinds of props like hats and scarves and things like that um, can really be quite fun and quite playful. And I want to invite you all to do more of these kinds of things um, whether it's in your home or in a group setting, to just sort of experiment with that. Utilize the National Center for Creative Aging as an opportunity for some ideas around those kinds of things. And then certainly as a, a last piece to close here, I, I just want to encourage you all, if you're eager to do something like that, I'd love to spend an hour with you sometime talking to you about all the details about how to bring those kinds of things successfully um, to your program. But I'm out of time. We knew this was ambitious today, but we wanted to give you, just kind of stimulate some ideas and new thinking. I'm happy to stay afterwards and talk to you as well about any questions you may have. And my phone number is on one of your handouts there, I think in the folder that you got this morning, not on the, the slides that I gave you there. So now it is my great pleasure Thank you all for being such good listeners. To introduce uh, my colleague, Carol Smith. <laughs> Carol's the coordinator for the Memories in the Making program at the Alzheimer's Association of Northern California and Northern Nevada. She's an MFT, and she um, has her master's in art therapy, as well as a, um, she has a 500-hour registered yoga therapist. <laughs> and now I need to switch this over. I promise I didn't cough on it. <laughs> Well, welcome. Luckily, my presentation and my slides are um, on the handout that you got. So if you want to take that out, it's got lines off to the side if you make notes. Or uh, I will shorten the presentation so we can get you to lunch at noon. We may go about five minutes over. Um, and uh, Nicole? Thank you, Dale. That was a great overview. And thank you to Nicole for doing all the electronics. Or tech. Dale's number, if you need to call her, it's, this slide is not in your handout. So please make a note of that number. That's the old one. What's that? That's the old one. What's the new one? What's the new one? So the new one is 831. I'm in Santa Cruz. That's the number. 831. 464. 464. 9982. 9982. We need to update our phone list. <laughs> okay, some objectives for today. Understand what process means how to set up a creative space at home, 
and two activities to help you relax, get centered, and reboot. This is aimed more at caregivers, but you can certainly teach it to your artist at home as a way to get centered and, um, well, as a way to get centered before you do art. And there's a handout in front of you. Some of them are on blue sheets, some of them are on white sheets. And it's abdominal breathing. It is a limb of the eight limbs of yoga. Most people think of yoga as um, doing the physical poses, the asanas. Um, this actually happens, um, the asanas work with the breathing and the centering to uh, get you ready for meditation and ultimately um, a higher power, arriving at the higher power. So what I want to do with you today is a little bit of that breathing practice. So go ahead and sit up straight, uncross your legs. Lower your chin a little. You can close your eyes for this or keep it open. If you keep your eyes open, focus on something on the table in front of you and soften your gaze. Okay, and then go ahead and exhale all the air in your lungs. And then inhale through your nose. Fill your lungs. Soften your shoulders and exhale. Now inhale again and fill your abdomen. Fill the lower lobes of your lungs and exhale. Inhale. Let your abdomen come out. And on the exhale, this time, tighten your lower belly. That helps the air go out by, by contracting your diaphragm. If you have problems with this, you can do it laying down at home by putting a, your hand on your belly and then filling your lungs so that your belly rises and then the air goes out. So the second a variation of this, the second activity for uh, breathing is to do it to a count. So go ahead and expel all your air, and then inhale to a count of four. Hold for two, relax your shoulders, exhale, one, two, three, four. Hold and then inhale for the count of four. One, two, three, four. Hold for two. And then exhale. One, two, three, four. Try it one more time. <coughs> count my count. And when you're finished with that breath, go ahead and open your eyes. You can increase the count from four, you can try six, try eight. But it centers you, it brings you, when you're counting and breathing, it's really hard to focus on other things that are going on around you. If you have any trouble with the breathing, discontinue it, try it at another time, and don't count. Just you know, take the normal breaths in, normal breaths out. Okay. Bringing art making into your home. This is based, um, expanded on the Memories in the Making program that we have in 22 uh, care communities around the Bay Area. It's um, before we begin. Process before product. So. What the art process does, it encourages communication and socialization. It decreases negative affect. It encourages the process. This is what we mean by process. It's not the product. It's not the end product. 
it's not, there's no goal in mind. It's the doing of the art process that is most effective. It has, there was research done at Stanford on the memories in the making, the effects of memory and the memories in the making. And the positive effects carry on throughout the day. So you have the art process and then you have the residual afterwards for the entire day, other activities. Offers your artist a sense of dig dignity, empowerment, and value, and a sensory stimulation. There's movement, there's vision, um, you can often play music in the background, um, which will influence the art. All right, Sally Jenny is the originator of the Memories in the Making uh, program, and she has a good point. Individuals with dementia are not children, and this is not a mental illness. This is a physical illness that's going on. It can be exacerbated by mental illness, but in general, it's it's they're not mental patients. Um, they're adults, they have rich histories, and the art is a conduit for exploring that. This is a um, painting by Mary. She painted one layer and then she went over it with washes of blacks and said that this is the Alzheimer's covering, covering everything. And that's my marriage, the Alzheimer's can never cover that. He never painted before he came into the group, and this happens a lot. People come into the care communities and um, or develop Alzheimer's at home, and if they can stay home, and have never painted before. So it becomes something new, but it's amazing how many Alzheimer's patients develop the ability to paint. People who have never done this before can all of a sudden do it. Um, it looks to me, I, I wasn't in charge of leading that artwork, but it looks to me like he used a sponge in different colors. Getting started. Okay, some strategies for success. And it kind of reiterates what um, Dale was saying. Treat the artist with dignity and respect. Be patient, calm, reassuring. Go with the flow. Um, that means be flexible. You know, don't don't have a plan in mind. Don't have expectations. It's um, surprising things will happen. Um, speak slowly, clearly, and simply. And work at if you're if you have an instruction, you're going to want to go down to their level rather than. You come over them like that. So that, that's uh, really important. Um, and maintain eye contact. What does it work? Do any of these things ever work? <laughs> no. Arguing, reasoning, confronting, reminding them that they didn't remember. You know, so, you know these are all kind of pointless. Don't take it personally. Sometimes that's hard. All right, starter kit. I put some together in the back of the room. They're $20. I did the footwork and got really good prices. So if you don't have art materials at home, this is a good start for you. You can go home and have a session tonight with what is in that kit. Um, these are on the slides. Um, although I did add blue painter's tape and I put two sponge brushes in instead of just one, which is what will be on your handout. You will need probably more watercolor brushes and maybe a sea sponge. I didn't put those in this kit because they're an investment. And brushes can be very expensive. And I recommend watercolor brushes. Uh, you can get some good ones. You can get some, but just try to avoid children's brushes. They're um, very rough, and the hair has come out. And an artboard. And this, I didn't put this in here either, number one, it wouldn't fit, but it's also 
would have driven the price up of the art bed. So you can get these um, online. Uh, those that information is in your handout, but it's also um, going to be coming up up here. Good quality makes a difference. Um, I put opaque watercolors and the members in the making programs use opaque watercolors. Um, they're, they're easier for aging eyes to see and they leave a, a more permanent color. Um, quality paper, watercolor paper. Um, if you're doing watercolor in the kits, there is a multimedia paper and it's pretty heavy. But you want it, the heavier the paper, the more it's going to accept watercolor. Good water-based markers and pencils. This is in your handouts. I'm going to be going kind of uh, quickly through here. Recommended supplies. We just more or less covered other materials. Um, pencils, watercolors, water-based markers, a portfolio. You will want to do this um, just to collect because you'll you'll have a lot. And where are you going to put it? A little portfolio like this you can pick up at any art supply store. Sometimes um, the memories in the making, because they have so much artwork and so many people that do it, usually fold a piece of paper like the size in half and then you can store it like that. This catalog is great for resources, for, for independent living. This is not in your handout either, so you might want to write this down. You can go online to goldviolin.com. And the reason I'm showing this is because I found these universal built-up handles that, you, that can accept pens, forks, and paintbrushes. You can also, if you don't have something that's pre-made like this, Make a yarn ball. Get a skein of yarn or old yarn and start making a ball. Don't make it real tight, but you can jam the um, handle of the brush in that and it becomes something that a hand that is contracting can hold on to. You can also wrap um, that squishy shelf paper around the brush and then wrap it with some tape. And that makes it a little, uh, a much bigger grip. Other supplies, containers for water. Um, try not to use glasses, especially if you have a drink near your painter because the brushes will end up in the drink. So um, little food containers, um, plastic cups, low ones. Um, I, if there's not a water source in the room, you will want to have a couple pitchers, one with water, one without water. Take the, the muddied water, put it in the empty, and fill it back up. But it's important to keep the water clean. Surface to work on. A table at a comfortable height works best for safety. So if you can, if you have a um, table at a good height for them, if they're in a wheelchair, you'll, you'll want to move them up to it and check and see. That's the safest. The board that I showed you will also work with a wheelchair, but it's um, if you can get them up to a table, that's much more secure. Uh, painter's tape, there's a roll of painter's tape in that uh, art kit, and um, it works as a boundary around the edge, which is good for aging eyes, and it also keeps the paper from um, folding or waving. Other helpful supplies, a small tabletop easel, uh, to hold an inspiration picture, um, pencils, okay, gone all of that. A spray bottle is a good thing. I did not put that in the kit, but if you have a spray bottle at home, um, spraying the paints before the artist begins is a good way to moisten. And then if the paper becomes dry and their brush starts, you know, the hairs in the brush start separating, you can spray the paper with a, with a spray bottle. Store supplies in a basket or box for easy access for your next session. It's good to stay organized. 
Art supplies not recommended. Oil, acrylic, craft paints, um, they're generally toxic and they're really messy and they're hard to clean. If you don't get your brushes clean after using any of them, they're destroyed. So that's why I like the water-based. Memories in the Making is a water-based program. Um, charcoal and wax crayons. Charcoal because it's messy. Wax crayons because children use crayons. So we want to have a, a little bit more adult type media. Permanent markers, the name says it all. Scissors require a fine set of motor skills. So if you know that, if you observe that your artist is struggling, then um, you want to do the cutting. Make it easy. If they want to do collage, then cut the pictures out, let them pick them, and then you can glue them down with a glue stick. Glue stick is in the bag. Um, or you can try tearing edges. Construction paper, copier paper, newsprint, all that paper yellows um, and fades or breaks down. The one exception is the copier paper because I um, included a project in here that you can use print paper, copy paper. Keeping supplies clean um, and sanitized. Uh, you don't want to expose um, your artists to unnecessary germs. Paintbrushes cost a lot. Like I said before, it's an investment. So uh, treat them like your makeup brushes for the women. Use, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Use hand soap or bar soap to clean them. Rinse well, shake off excess water. Reset the point and lay it down flat. If you lay it, if you dry it by its handle sticking up, either down or up, um, you'll wreck the point and the metal part of the um, tip of the brush can loosen over time because it's only glue. Cap markers, wipe off with a sanitizing wipe. Watercolor, the color can Watercolor pans can be misted and wiped off, or they can be rinsed off. Okay, so this I love this picture because um, it's he looks so comfortable. It is such an ideal watercolor situation. Natural light. He's at the right height. Some ideas for inspiration. Keep the, keep your uh, calendars. Keep your calendars and use those pictures. The bigger and brighter, the better because of aging eyes. So um, detailed landscapes are okay, but they don't work as well as like a close-up of an animal or a flower. Um, still life, if you want to work from real, um, you can be seasonal with it. Right now, you probably want to put some ornaments out, something big and bright, and um, or, a, or a menorah. We're still in... Monica, um, if you have uh, like an Imelda Marcos artist, you can put shoes out. They, it's you know what appeals, to, what formerly appealed to them will most likely appeal to them now. Um, and ideas from imagination. Sometimes people want to paint from their imagination rather than have um, still life or a calendar piece. Um, time of day is important. Uh, midday is usually the best. To, it's an effort to get going in the morning the older you get. And, you have dementia, it's even more difficult. Um, and location, you want it to be a quiet space, free from distractions. Um, <coughs> set up the supplies before your artist gets there. And set up supplies for yourself, because oftentimes that helps entice your artist to participate and it's also extremely extremely relaxing for you. Um, keep instructions short. Above all, there are no mistakes in art. That is the um, that is the goal with the flow that we alluded to before. Um, this is a continuation. Every picture tells a story. This becomes the fun part. If your if your artists can, uh, they're still speaking. This becomes uh, an opportunity to talk about memories, long-term memories. Uh, 
also keep open to new images. Don't push. This is just for fun. Um, I have five minutes. Um, be genuine in your response to them. They'll know. So it's, it's important to be genuine and sincere yourself. Ideas to get started or just plain old ideas how to get your artist to the table is if you're gonna if you say to them uh, let's go paint they're gonna say I don't want to paint so you have to couch it in terms of let's have some fun can you help me with this and you've set it up already so all you have to do is get your artist to the spot and it may be that you have to start painting first and or you may have to do a partner painting paint together. You can paint from a theme like what's our favorite food? What's our favorite activity? What was our favorite vacation? What was your favorite vacation? Uh, found objects right there in the second to the last one right there. Um, if you go out for a walk and you find leaves or you find uh, you know, rocks, other things. Um, I once in a found object assignment uh, found a crushed Coke cup and did a rubbing with it. So you can do that. You can come home and do rubbings with it, or you can include it in your artwork somehow. This is a partner painting by Art and Jean. So someone started it and someone carried on with it. You can do it at the same time, too. It's not, there are no rules. Um, get to know your artist. Let them feel in control, and this goes across the board in all activities. Um, provide opportunities so that they can make the decisions. Um, they have choice. It's empowering. Um, keep your water clean so you don't watch for muddy colors. You can also subtly, if it's not taped down, move the paper because sometimes they'll perseverate and kind of stay in the same spot. So just kind of shift the paper a little and there, uh, you will get the muddy colors. Okay. Open-ended questions are how you want to elicit information from them, stories. Okay, so this is the one exception to copy paper. Um, I use these books with um, usually with children, kids that don't um, want to do art, and it works with adults. Um, it, this is called Everyone's Mandala Coloring Book. This is volume two. They have like five volumes now. And they're just these great drawings that you can color. Um, they work with pencil and water-based markers. Um, you can enlarge them and print them off if you have access to a printer, enlarge them and print them off or uh, you can shrink them and put them on regular 8.5 by 11 paper. <clears throat> Create an outline to contain the painting area. Use a dinner plate. You don't need a compass. You don't need special things for this. Um, in front of you, you have some sample art on the 11 by 14 paper. There are some that are collages, there are some that are mandalas. Um, I put them there for you, you can doodle on them, take a photo of them, we're not gonna have time now. Um, and give you some ideas to go from. This will be in your handout too, you have some more ideas. Um, you can also use, like I said before, the blue painter's tape around the edge to define a border. Then you can select a starter picture. And you can extend or draw around the picture. Now this would be someone that is probably an engineer. Okay. And there are no rules, basically. There's just safety rules. You want to keep your artists safe. So they might be able to do this. They might freehand it. Or they might just extend with the whatever they want to do, basically. It's, it's all open. That's going with the flow. Okay, importance of a title. And this is really important. Because what would you think that is? Anybody? Yeah, it looks like a flower. Some exotic flower. But in fact, 
It's called a queen from Canada in high heels, with high heels. She's been married once and stayed married, although she wasn't in love with him, King George. So here, this is the important thing. You have to get the title at the time that they're painting because you'll take it back to them next week and say, um, uh, can you tell me what this is? And they'll say, I didn't paint that. And they won't be able to give you a title. So it's, you know, even if it's like an opinion about it, like art making is fun, I've seen that as a title. So it's, titles are important. Here's another one that if you didn't see the alligator coming out of the water, you wouldn't know it was an alligator. But as soon as you see the title, you can tell that indeed that is an alligator. Same with this. You know, it, it looks like, I don't know what it looks like, but it bombs over London and becomes very clear that this person was probably in the blitz. Other thing is to consider, store the artwork in a portfolio, document the stories, wash the brushes, where to buy art supplies. DickBlick.com, this is all in your handouts. Um, Michael's, look for weekly coupons. They, have, they always have coupons. Aaron Brothers has one cent sales. I, th I think it's twice a year. University art stores and independent art stores. Um, tabletop easels, water containers, keep your eyes open at garage sales. And um, um, secondhand stores, Salvation Army, you can, you can, you know, <coughs> Round around and find what you need. Okay, and then there is some, there are some ideas in your uh, handout. Also, use the internet. You might even want to go in and look at images and print them out, and that can be the inspiration for your um, artist's artwork. When faced with blank paper, ask them to draw or paint what makes you happy. What makes you feel relaxed? Draw me a happy memory and add a title and date. Dating is important too. In addition to that title, you want to do a date. You can contact me if you have any questions or you need ideas, consult. Okay. So that's it. <laughs> it's lunchtime. <laughs>